All right, so let's start with the first section of this module where we'd be learning about the nature of the Arabic language. This section uh, is uh, based around three main discussions. Um, the first one would be the discussing the idea of language inflection, how languages are classed into two main groups, inflected and uninflected languages, and uh, Mu'arim and Mabni being the Arabic terms for them. Um, what are the characteristics of these two different classes of languages? And then we'll go on to uh, establish that Mu'arim languages possess a linguistic superiority over Mabni languages. And, uh, and then once uh, we have established that, um, we'll discuss the the fact that Arabic being a Morab language, what does it entail? What's what uh, speciality uh, does Arabic? What what uh, what special powers does uh, does that characteristic um, endow the Arabic language? So, if Arabic is a Morab, i.e., an inflected language, what kind of special powers does it endow this this uh, this language? That Allah chose for His uh, final revelation. So. This will be the rough structure of this section, inshallah. So let's start with the idea of uh, language inflection, okay? So the Cambridge Dictionary defines language inflection, like so. An uh, inflected language, i.e. a Ma'arab language, is a language that changes the form or ending of some words when the way in which they are used in sentences changes. Um, it's Latin, Polish, and Finnish are all highly in inflected languages, and so was ancient Greek. Um, and all of the, your Semitic languages, i.e., Hebrew, uh, Assyriac, um, these are these are all inflect, inflected languages, and so is Arabic. Right. So this this definition talks about two main things. First one, being the fact that the word itself changes um, form. Right. Let me just change the color for this. Um, let's use this one. Right, so the word changes the form itself. So the word itself changes. It morphs. It morphs. It, it, it morphosizes to different forms, and then its ending changes as well. Okay. Uh, these are the two um, main characteristics of an of an inflected language. Now, some languages, either some inflected languages, either um, only change the word form. Or they only change the endings uh, of their words, or they do some bits uh, of uh, either of these, but not fully. So there's this 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 kind of inflection that is um, uh, inferior, or uh, you know, not of the optimal degree, where it uh, endows the in, or, you know it's uh, it's it, the, the language those um, special properties that we will talk about. And then there's, infle in, there's this type of inflection that is quite a lot of inflection. It's, it's unhealthy, okay? So there's, the, there's this inflection that is too minimal, so minimal that it uh, really makes no difference uh, to the language. Um, it, might have, uh, it might as well have been uh, an uninflected language and it would have been uh, fine. Or then, you know, on the other end, you have this such a high degree of inflection that it really uh, makes the language complicated, such as some uh, Slavic language, like, you know, and then Russian as well has, has that problem. Um, but then you have this, this, this midpoint, just the optimal degree of inflection. That is where uh, Arabic lies, and no other language reaches that pinnacle. Okay, subhanAllah. Um, right, so... If I can illustrate that by example, for example, if you have the root word kataba in Arabic, let's say you have the root word kataba, right? This one word, kataba, can be changed, transformed into over 300 words. This word can, can take 300 shapes, right? So if I could, if, if I was to read some some words that would that sound similar to that, they have they use the same root, they they use the same root as kaf da ba, 
you will have kataba uh, yaktubu katiban katib kutiba yuktabu uh, maktub right lam yaktub lam yuktub la yaktub la yaktubu la yuktabu la yaktub la yaktub la yuktaba al amru minhu uktub li 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 yaktub um then you can have uh, you know li li yaktub li yuktab la yaktub la yuktab la taktub la tuktab right so you can have all of these shapes and then you can have for example um uh um you know uh, maktab maktabani maktabuna makatib mukaytib miktab miktabani mikatib uh and then uh, uh mikaytib um you can have forms such as um kutba kutbayani kutbayat right you can have uh, um aktub aktabani aktabuna right so these are all forms of the same word and then you can and each of these words have uh added the um pronouns the the relevant pronouns to them uh and they can take over 300 different forms right in arabic that it happens to the to that kind of degree where one root can have one 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 uh root uh of a of a word can can take so many forms that it can be used into so many different ways and then of course there's many other forms that i have not mentioned um right so that that make, that helps you understand this um then take the example of the ending of some words right if i say uh ja'a rajulun rajulun right that's one ra'aytu this is the second one ra'aytu rajulan right rajulun rajulan and then marartu bi rajulin rajulin you see the first one has an un as its ending the second one has an an and the last one has an in as its ending right so these this this is what an an an, an uh, inflected language uh, is um you might be familiar with say some spanish words say senor and then senora right senor and senora as senor for um a, a, a mister um the the r is silent but when you talk about a miss you say senora or right? you add an r at the end um uh, if you're familiar with some arabic uh, some some italian words uh, my apologies if you're familiar with some italian words you must you know you might you might have heard of uh, say bella bello bellissima bellissimo right so these these are these are some examples um and because italian spanish all of the, these are all latin languages they all have latin as root and latin is an inflected language so they inherit a property from it but these these languages um they use inflection to varying degrees degrees um okay so th- i hope this explains the idea of inflection now talking by by example right um in an inflected language the words may be matched almost to suit the writer i e these these the words in an inflected language normally do not take their meaning from the positioning or the structure of the word in a sentence right you can put different words on different places you can move move them around right and the sentence would still make perfect sense whereas english for example which is an un uh, inflected language right within certain limits the order determines the relation between groups of words right for example look at the sentence here where it says um khalid gave ali a book right so because english is an uninflected language each word is a standalone entity which does not morph to give different words unless those words that have been inherited from a latin tongue like french for example all those uh, uh cognates that have been taken from french or other languages which are uh, inflected but really in english every, every word is a standalone entity okay and um if you notice here each of these words are put in a in a in a, in a place in relation to the word next to it and if this order was disturbed 
the sentence would lose its meaning, as I we have uh, demonstrated in the second example here. If I just say book Khalid gave Ali a, that makes no sense, right? That makes no sense, right? Now, if I if I translated this first sentence into Arabic, right, it would read as أعطى خالد عليا كتابا. Now, if I did exactly the same sort of jumbling around of the words as in the second English sentence, right, it makes perfect sense in Arabic, right, because. Arabic, being an inflected language, does not derive the meaning of its sentence from the order uh, of the words itself. Rather, it derives its meaning from the ending of each of the words, right? So if I was to say, right, you have, say, um, something like, uh, um, if, this is, if this is your um, subject, verb, object one, and object two, if this is your your structure in English, right? English would not function if this if this structure was was uh, was broken, right? And the the sentence only gives its full meaning when the structure is met. But in Arabic, if you notice, the object has been put over here, subject here, verb here, and then the other object here. Right? So this tells you the Arabic does not derive its meaning from the order or the positioning of the words in a sentence, right? Rather it takes its meaning from the from these case endings, right? Where the where how the word ends de determines what that means in a sentence. And when words put together, right, would give you the whole sense of the sentence. Right? So the positioning is less important um, in an inflected language. And more so in the Arabic language. Now, this this idea of subject, verb, object, right? It's it's given in the Arabic language not through the order, as we've said, but rather the endings, right? So the un would demonstrate um, a subject, an would demonstrate an object, right? So ali and kitaban in this Arabic sentence are both uh, your objects, object one, object two. Khalidun, because it has an un, it tells you this is the subject, and the, this is the person who is giving, a'ta, he's the one who's giving. How do we know that? Because of the un sound, not the order of the word. I could have put Khalidun in the beginning, and it would make perfect sense even then. Okay, so this is, this is your inflection, right? But there's another thing. Because, because the meaning of these, of these, um, uh, were, the meaning, the meaning, the meaning of the sentence is being given by not the the structure, but by the endings of each of these words. When you put these words in a different positioning, right? When you put these words in a different position from the previous one, right? It adds another layer of meaning. It adds another layer of meaning, right? And uh, inshallah, we'll cover this idea in the next section where we talk about the uh, superiority. Of morab, i.e., inflected languages over uninflected languages. Okay, so now that we've understood the difference between an inflected and an uninflected language, inflected um, would be Arabic and uninflected would be English. Um, now that we've understood that um, dichotomy in the two classes of languages, Let's talk about why is an inflected language linguistically superior to an uninflected language. Um, because we're th keeping things brief, um, we'll just discuss four uh, very important uh, ways of looking at, at, at an uh, inflected, la inflected language that makes it stand out um, far and above um, an uninflected language in, in terms of its case use, usage and, um, and, and it, is, it makes it pretty clear why an inflected language is, is superior to an um, uninflected language. Right, so if we start with the bottom first, we've already talked about this idea of an expansive vocabulary. But it's not just that one root word can be transformed into these 300 or more shapes that's not that's not the um, 
that's not quite the, 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 the magnitude that we are trying to convey with this. When we say that, you know, one root word can be, con can be converted into so many different forms, what, it e what is even more important for us to realize is that these words are, inter are interdependent, right? So you can, you can learn one word, and because these forms are unanimous um, in different roots, for example, a different root would take similar forms, you, if you just knowing one word of, of any one root, you could, you could easily understand or even use in your own speech over three to four hundred different words, right? And each of those words are, are related to each other by the root, yes, but even the words that are not quite related um, in terms of their, their yes, they're, they're related in terms of their root letters, but not in terms of their root vowels. Right, even the even even the words that are related to each other in terms of just the letters and not the vowels, right? Even those words have interdependency. Even they share a common meaning, right? So that that they really makes you appreciate how deep the Arabic language can become with this property. Um, I'll give you an example. For example, what's the difference between uh, um, if I say? color if I if, what's the difference between if I say bir okay um bar and bur hmm. bir is um your manners your your etiquette your your love, your, your care, your kindness to your parents. That's what birr is, birr al-walidin, that Allah has commanded us with, uh, commanded, us all, commanded, commanded us all with, uh, to look after our parents. That's, that's all birr, right? Um, being being dutiful to our parents, being kind to them, being, being loving to them, being, being caring towards them. All of these fall under the word birr, right? Now, the second word, barr, uh, is... Land, earth, right? The land is called bur, and bur is what um, comes off the skin of 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 the of the um, wheat uh, seeds when you clean them to make flour, right? That's what bur is. Is right? It's, it's just um, it's, it's like shaft. Mm -hmm. Um. If you were to pay attention, there's nothing common in between the three words, right? But if you understood that because these words have the same root letter, they must also share the same root meaning, although that meaning has been, uh, has been, has been hidden by the use case of these words, but the, all of these words initially were coined because of that meaning uh, in mind, right? And the ulama, like... Uh, Raghib al Isfahani, the author of Al Mufradat of the Quran, is very uh, Imam of the Lugha. He mentions that what is common in between these three words is expansiveness. Right? Bir. The reason why the word bir is used uh, in, in, in the Quran as opposed to other words for kindness and love and dutifulness to the parents um, is because bir is all expansive. It's all-encompassing love, all-encompassing care, all-encompassing kindness towards the parents. Bar, land, and land, as we see, it's it's expansive, right? It's it's we see, you know, when we travel across the lands, when we we see um, on uh, you know Google Maps, for example, now we see expansiveness, right? Land is expansive, right? It goes it stretches far and beyond our eyes can see, right? That's bar expansiveness. And bur, when you clean wheat, right, to make flour, the the shaft the and and the, the, the hay that, that comes off it, the, the the powder, the you know the the the, the cover the, the the covering of the wheat seed seedling, right. When you extract this the the, the inside insides of the wheat seed from it, right, it it expands. Then the powder sort of fills the air, right, it expands into the air, right. So that meaning of expansiveness, right, is is what is. Is, is in all of these different words. 
right? So vocabulary in, 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 in Arabic especially, and not just other, we can't speak for other in, in, in inflected languages because, as we said, some languages are, you know, um, they are, they have, they had to use very, they're either very weak, uh, weakly inflected, or they're so highly inflected that it makes it detrimental to their uh, nature, right? Whereas Arabic is right in the, that, that optimal sweet spot where, you know, it uses the, 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 the most optimal and the best way of, of inflection in the form of the word and as well as the, the ending of the word, okay? Without overcomplicating and without um, overburdening of, of uh, words and the, lengthening the words up, right? It makes, it's, 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 it's optimal. It's just the right amount of, of, of inflection, right? So you see why, how this, this property in Arabic, subhanAllah, Right, the interdependence of vocabulary, and and how, as we've discussed already, by the by the example of kataba, the words are not just that they detect different forms and many forms, but that for words of different, same root letters but same, vo- different vowels could also be de- in de- like they, they they could share the, the meaning between themselves, and then the ulama go as far as say, for example, if you have some some word like kataba. Uh, Right and and uh, say, um, uh, for example, uh, kabata, whereas the ba and ta switch around. Even these two words, which have meaning with each other, right? This is the science of istiqaq, right? Just like we have nahab and sarf, we have, we have the science of istiqaq, right? It, sarf sarf is uh, istiqaq is like a precursor to the science of sarf, but it's uh, it's not as important in in the beginning of our journey to learn Arabic, right? It's just impo- it's important and it's enough suffices us to know that. There is this property called ishtiqaq that different words are related to each other and that they are independent to each other, right? Interdependent, right? They share the same meaning and then the use cases determine their, their practical uh, meaning, but they have that original meaning in them that determines their interdependency, right? So that's, that's, that's one of the key differences that separates um, uh, Arabic, especially from other languages from other uninflected languages especially but of course from other inflected languages like latin and polish as well right so this tells you why why allah would choose the quran uh to be re- revealed in, in the arabic language because the language could afford such an expansive interdependent vocabulary that could be so vast in terms of its um in, in terms of its word bank, but at the same time inter- interdependent so that the, the, the person who's listening, learning, reading, like it's easy for him to grasp the meaning, get to the, get to the deeper meanings of the words. Whereas if you were to start reading uh, English, you, you wouldn't, it would take you a very long time to, to get really good with, with uh, uh, the meaning of different words. But with Arabic, because the words are interdependent and they are linked and they're the forms of different forms of the, of the same root letter and same root meaning, it's so much easier to learn Arabic language. Um, okay, so that's one of the key reasons, one of the biggest reasons why Arabic um, and, uh, and other infected languages are superior to un, uh, uninfected languages, but especially Arabic, and why Arabic is, is the most superior of the, of, of the other languages, okay? So this is from the perspective of its expansive, interdependent, Vocabulary, okay? Moving on, poetry. Because Arabic has this inflection of its internal form and its external, i.e. the ending, case endings, right? It affords Arabic a very, very, very unique kind of precision in poetry. No other language is advanced, as advanced as Arabic is in terms of its science of poetry, right? And I'll give you an example. This is very, this is, it's like it's a mind-boggling example, um, and it really shows you the, the genius of of the Arabs, especially and none, none, you know nothing to do with their own intellect, but rather the the, the beauty of the Arabic, the 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 subhanAllah, the superiority of their language to the point where the Arabs used to call everyone else dumb. You know, you must have heard of the words Arabi and Ajami. Ajami literally means dumb. That's, that's what it means, right? So you have Arab and Ajam. Of course, later on, the, Ajim, the word Ajam is uh, you, it meant to be used for not just 
not not just for its literal meaning, but for rather its uh, practical meaning, i.e., non-Arabs. Okay, but in 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 its in its literal and its original sense, it was to do with Arabs calling others dumb because no one else had the expressive powers as they did. And I'll give you an example. So, um, one of the most um, eloquent and well-renowned or uh, poets of the of the uh, pre-Islamic uh, era of of, uh, of the Arabic uh, people, um, it was Imr al Qais. Imr al Qais, right? He was one of the most renowned poets. His works are still preserved. He has a whole Diwan. Um, by the you know, it, um, people in the Madaris they study just a little you know. Uh, odes of his uh, work, but he's he's left uh, some some work and some some expansive work, and um, it's, it's really remarkable poetry. It's really not of much um, uh, wisdom, utility, um, or even like practical utility. It's it's more about about, about love and um, relationships and and uh, s- sadness and this and that. But the, the beauty of the language. Um, it still astounds the uh, Arabic reader. So anyway, I'll give you the the I'll I'll share with you the incident of his death. Some some highway robbers, they um, of course they um, ganged up on him, cornered him. Uh, before they killed him, he said, "You know, before you kill me, give this to my. I only have two daughters, and um, I don't have anyone uh, other than them in the world. So if you can please." take this message to them um, upon my death and give this whatever belongings I have on me to them um, that you don't want to take, right? Anyway, the robbers, back in the day, Arabs, they are known for their word. So these, these robbers, they gave them, gave them the, their word, they killed him. And they took this message to his uh, daughters to X, and, X, Y, and Z village um, in the desert. And um, so the message was given to the daughters, and the daughter opens this message on the parchment, and it says, um, it says this, Ya Yibnata Yibnata Imra Al-Qaisi Inna Aba Kuma إن أبا كوما إن يبنة امرأة القيسي إن أبا كوما and that's it that's all it said there was nothing else written on the paper but because these are the daughters of the greatest poets of the Arabic history one of the greatest poets of the Arabic history this was in, an encrypted message right and because these are the daughters of the you know, one of the greatest poets of Arabic history, they deciphered it. All they had to do was complete the second line of this of this verse to decode the message. And it could only be done, it could only be done by very specific words that fit the scale of the first uh, half of this verse, right? And because Arabs, were, they were so intuitively... Uh, trained to um, spot those patterns in those, those uh, vazn scales these 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 uh, these daughters um, they immediately you know uh, of course became very sad and you know that they realized that their father their father died how did they do that right well before we do before we get to that let, let me just tell you let me just finish the story first right so these these girls you know they told the high robbers oh thank you so much you're such gentlemen uh, for um, bringing uh, back to us our father's, l- you know, last uh, things. And um, we'd like to thank you by, by taking you to the, uh, the leader of our tribe so that he may, he may thank you personally. Anyway, these girls uh, take these, these robbers to the guy and, and, uh, and, and instead of saying what they said, they, they told him, Arrest these guys and kill them for they've killed our father. How did they? How did they do? That? How did? How did they know that? Right? How did they know that? They knew that by the fact that Arabic has these these forms 
that have a certain intonation to them, certain rhythm to them, right? And they have to balance. If they don't balance, the 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 the, the line of poetry is is not good, right? It's 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 crap. It's it's not of any good use, right? And it's not acceptable by the um, but the Arab poets, right? It was not accepted. It was very. They had very strict kind of, uh, you know, uh, subhanallah criteria for judging poetry, and these were the masters. So they finished the line of poetry thus: Yabnata imra al Qaisi inna abakuma. O daughters of Imr al Qais, verily, your father. Qad. Right? That's the only way they could fin- you could finish that line of poetry. As is written in the books of uh, history. Right, so Yibnata Imra al Qaisi in Abakuma, Qad Kutila wa Qatila Huladakuma. Right? That O daughters of Imr al Qais, verily your father has indeed been killed, and his two killers are with you two. That's the only way you could, you could balance a line of poetry. Right? So it's because of the, the, the optimal degree of inflection the Arabic language has that it affords this, this kind of um, masterful poetry that no other language possesses. Hands down, no other language possesses. It's a claim that you know, we, can, we can defend in, in, in the court of science. No other language affords this, this degree of optimal inflection that allows for, for it to produce such a beautiful um, masterpieces of poetry. SubhanAllah. Okay? So, I hope you guys find that interesting, inshallah. And lastly, we'll come to this idea... Um, of brevity and precision in communication and how the the sentence structure is determined not by how the speaker wants to say it but how the audience um, uh, how the how the audience should hear it okay and I'll and we'll explain that using the uh, example of some sentences in English here yeah? we'll translate each of these sentences into Arabic and see how this works, okay? So two things, precision and brevity in communication and how the structure of the sentence is determined not by the person who wants to say it but rather by the person who is being addressed, okay? So Khalid gave Ali, but this is a standard sentence. You have your subject first, then your verb, then your object and second object, okay? And this is, of course, um, Standard structure in Arabic, so a'ta, verb always comes first. First, a'ta, Khalidun, Aliyan, Kitaban. Okay, a'ta, Khalidun, Aliyan, Kitaban. Okay, now this is a standard sentence. The first sentence in its uh, standard structure as per the English language and the first sentence in Arabic, the translation of it, is in the standard um, form or standard structure of, of an Arabic sentence where the verb always comes first, then the subject and then the object, right? Now, if you were to say it was a book that Khalid gave Ali it was a book that Khalid gave Ali. For you to convey that meaning in English, you have, you've had to introduce a few more words into the sentence and change the order of the words. And if you were to change this particular sentence, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't give you the, the same meaning. In fact, the meaning would be lost. So you have, you've had to add, it was, right, that, right? So you've added these, these words to this, to give that meaning that it was a book that Khalid gave Ali, right? Not, not a pen, not a uh, pair of trousers, not, not sunglasses, nothing. It was, a, it was a book that Khalid gave Ali, right? So, and you've had to, you know, sort of um, 
just move this subject verb object ahead and it was a book that so you, you you have to do this with english but with arabic you wouldn't do that you wouldn't you you don't you don't have to add any new words that same meaning is 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 conveyed by just moving the word kitaban at the beginning right the sense in this, the rest of it is remains the same kitaban a'ta Khalidun Aliyan. Okay? Aliyan. Right? And then look at the third sentence. It was Ali, not Umar, not Usman, not Abu Bakr, not, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z person. It was Ali that Khalid gave the book to. Right? That Khalid gave the book to. Right? So now that. You see, like it was, it was the same thing, like, the same problem. Like you have, you've had to add words to the sentence to convey that kind of different meaning. It was Ali that um, Khalid gave the book to, right? So you've had, you've had to add more words. Right, not just that you've had to change the structure of the sentence significantly to get the same to get that meaning, but in Arabic it doesn't work like that. All you had to do was just shift Ali to the beginning, Aliyan, Aliyan, Aata, Khalid, Kitaban. Okay. And the last sentence, um, it was Khalid, not Umar, not Usman, no, no one else, but it was Khalid who gave Ali the book, right? In Arabic, again, you don't have to um, add these more words, right? English requires these, these additions. It was who, right? Ali, the, right? So Arabic doesn't, do, doesn't require that. All, all, all you need to do is just move Khalid to the beginning. Right? Khalidun a'ta aliyan kitaban. Okay? Kitaban. So you see where English requires a significant structure change to the sentence and it requires more words to convey that kind of extra meaning. Arabic doesn't need that. So brevity and precision. Brevity and precision, right? Um, another example of, of precision would be, for example, if you want to say something like, um, something like, right, uh, protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Right? In Arabic, it will just be this. That's it. Right, so numerous, numerous examples of this idea that Arabic is way more precise and it's way more, way more um, brief when it comes to conveying the most important meanings, right? It doesn't require uh, all of these uh, extra words to, to f as fillers, right? Th those, those meanings are, are conveyed by the tanweens, uns, uns, and ins, okay? And of course, the, the structure, the way words are joined, um, they're also... Uh, adds in the, the the pronouns, for example. If I if I, if I was to say, um, the herba, the herba, or the herba tool, right? This 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 one word, which is three lettered, it means he went. Right, the herb tool. I went. Right, if I say the herb. The hub tum, right? It will be you all went, you all. Okay. So anyway, this speaks about the brevity and the precision of the Arabic language. That each word is used for a very specific meaning, and synonyms of different words are not used as freely, right? For example, in the hadith. The, the 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 Sahabi, 
He says that when the Prophet used to stand up from his 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 uh, such as after the second rakah, he used to stand up, not not by the word qama. He, he the Sahabi does not use the word qama. He uses the word nahalla, nahalla. Okay, nahalla. Why nahalla not qama? Because qama is 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 standing, generally. But Nahada is standing with some force. It's like standing quickly, right? Standing up in an active fashion, right? Not slowly, not like a lazy person, not tired. Nahada, with, with energy, right? To show that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray with energy, with love of, for the prayer, right? Longing for the prayer. He used to enjoy the prayer. He Nahada, he did not just stand up. He Nahada, he was active in the prayer, right? So... Inshallah, I hope that, that, that's, that those, those examples are enough to give you the idea that the Arabic subhanAllah is, it deals with this idea that, that precision and, and brevity is really, really vital to its, to its uh, uh, nature. Right? And no other language comes even close to Arabic in, 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 these, in this regard. So the expansive, interdependent vocabulary, the, the beauty of, the, of its poetry, um, the, the, the brevity and the precision of its, of its speech. And lastly the audience-focused uh, speech. In Arabic, at least in the classical Arabic, the modern standard Arabic is not uh, the same as classical Arabic in this regard at least. Right. In classical Arabic, speech is always formed or formulated or communicated in relation to the person who is being addressed, not how you want to say it. Okay. So judging by these uh, examples, for example, that you have in front of you, if I, if, if I had someone in front of me, um, if I had someone in front of me uh, who does not know anything about Khalid giving Ali anything, I'll, if I was telling him as, as this as a, as, as a first instance that Khalid gave Ali a book, he'd be like, oh, cool, that's nice, right, cool. Khalid gave Ali a book. That's cool. You should give, you know, giving gifts is nice. So that's, 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 that's nice what Khalid did. Nice, right? That's the kind of addressee for this first sentence. But if you look at the second sentence, the second sen sentence assumes that the person al already knows that Khalid gave Ali something. Right? Khalid gave Ali something. But he, he doesn't know what it was. Right, so you, you you clarify the second sentence. Sentence clarifies to him it was a book that Khalid gave Ali, right? It was a book that Khalid gave Ali, um, and then this third sentence is um, uh, assumed that you know the person knows that Khalid gave a book to someone, but he doesn't know who Khalid gave the book to. So the person says it was Ali that Khalid gave the book to, and and for example the fourth sentence assumes that the person knows that Ali was given a book, but he doesn't know who gave him that book. So you tell him it was Khalid who gave Ali the book, right? Um, but in Arabic, you have the sentence, right? And it tells you that that, that sentence, that sentence, based on or these these examples are quite primitive in terms of its case usage, right? But in Arabic, every sentence is primed towards the audience, right? Now, if I if I if I if I said this, if I said any of these sentences in in the passive, if I said a book was given uh, to Ali by Khalid, right? Um, that that could be used for the first case, right? Or the second case, or the third case, or the fourth case. It could be that sentence could be used in all cases, without the precision of. Of meaning and without keeping the audience in mind, the passive sense. But if I was to produce that same sentence in passive in Arabic, right, each case would be different, right? The same structure would, would follow, except the word a'ta would be u'atiyya. Kitabun, right? U'atiyya, aliyun, khalid, right? So the, the, the structure would be, would be significantly uh, different in English. Right, um, in terms of the, the, the same sentence could be, the same sentence could be used for all four cases, but in Arabic the the same the, the, the sentence structure would be different, 
for each of the four sentences. So each different each sentence would still convey different case scenarios based on the structure of the words, right? So this is this is important, right? This is why Arabic is superior to all other languages, right? It has these characteristics, which we would uh, talk more about in the next section, inshallah. But just as a summary for this, uninflected languages, especially English language and others, they use and they solely rely on the the structure and the positioning of the words in a sentence to give their meaning, right? And to to convey different meanings, right? And to convey these different case scenarios they would have to bring in more words or significantly alter the, the, the structure of the sentence. But in Arabic, it doesn't, it doesn't happen like that, right? You don't need any extra words to convey all of these different types of meanings. All you need to do is maybe just move one word, right? And that conveys that meaning, right? And this, is, this keeps in line with the precision and brevity of the language and how the Arabic language is more audience-focused as opposed to the person who's speaking, right? It's very, very important that Arabic is understood as a language which is which caters for its audience first and foremost before the person who's speaking it right inshallah but also the lesser inflected languages as well and how arabic is right at the optimal point where the inflection it uses it's it's just perfect for its for its meaning for its internal form factor and its case endings to convey its meaning and to convey an expansive uh, amount of words by using very few root letters, right? So now that we've established that Arabic is a model of language, is, is an effective language, and how it's superior to all other languages, and we have seen somewhat, some sort of characteristics of the Arabic language through some examples that we've been discussing, and you have seen some of these things uh, in your reading of Qira, uh, of, of your Qisas al Nabiyyin as well. It's important that we detail those characteristics in a more clear manner, just so that we build a, a mental picture of these characteristics so that we can spot them when we see them. And and because later Nah works, the higher works of, of grammar, they rely on these concepts a lot. They heavily rely on these concepts. They invoke these words, these terminologies all the time. So it's important that we build these uh, into our knowledge as foundation of the science. And it will help us a lot in our study of the subject later on, inshallah. So, so far, we have this that Arabic, right, has inflection. Arabic has an inflection, which is internal. Okay, and we have the inflection which is is external, i.e., are the case endings, right? The case endings. Right? External. I.e. the case endings, okay? Now internal inflection is the subject matter of sarf. You study this in Sarf, and inshallah will cover more of this in detail in Sarf, okay? As far as the external inflection, i.e. the case endings are concerned, i.e. the endings of Arabic words are concerned, right? There's two things mainly that we've covered. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the external features are uh, case endings, of course. So one is your uh, case endings more specifically, i.e. the endings of each of the words, right? And secondly was this the structure, the structure of the words in a sentence, right? This structure of uh, the, the words in a sentence, right, is the subject matter of Balagha, i.e. Arabic rhetoric, which, which is uh, beyond the scope of this uh, course. It's quite advanced. It, it's, it, that, that, that is the knowledge of the structure of different words and the meanings behind the usage of different words. Uh, it's quite advanced uh, study. And uh, you can only study that once you have really strong grounding in Arabic uh, grammar, i.e. Nahav Ansarf. Right? So we'll not touch the structure of the words, i.e. how do we 
uh, understand words being in different places and in different in, in different sentences and how what kind of meanings uh, do they imply x y and z that's what balagha okay in this course inshallah we'll be covering sarf but that, that, the sarf content will be covered in sarf 101 and that'll be the next module inshallah for now we're going to focus on the case endings right the endings of the words because it's it's it's, it's the case endings that give you the, the, the most vital information about the, the value of the word in a sentence, i.e. how do you identify a subject, a verb, an object, um, and all the connectors in a sentence? How do you, how do, you do that? Right? Um, well, by two things. Right? Either the word that you are looking at is... Steady state is a steady state word, a mabni word, or it's a mu'rab word, right? Yes, the same word, inflected and uninflected, right? So Arabic, some words have um, a degree of uh, uninflection in Arabic, but those are individual words because they are the words of most common usage and they are mostly connectors, like letters, huruf, um, um, for example, in English you have or, and, if, these kind, these kind of words, right? Um, mu'rab are mostly your nouns and uh, verbs so mabni would be the case where it's a, it's a very specific case and the words are limited for this inshallah and, and when we cover the the most common uh, recurrent uh, words in usage um we'll cover these mabnis uh, at that point but when it comes to morab because this is this is this is what it really conveys um and this this is what is uh, what forms um the, the foundation of your sentence structure, i.e. subject, verb, object uh, identification, will cover this aspect, okay? Mabni just means that the word doesn't change. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a steady state word, right? Steady state, uninflected words. Steady state, right? Steady state. They don't change their forms. Like, for example, min, from, ila, to, um, qad, verily, inna, Indeed, right? All these words are, right? The Amabni, they, they, they don't change their, their, their states because they're just, they're just connectors, right? They're just connectors. And as, as we said, um, the words that convey the meaning of being a subject or a verb or an object, right? These are the words that concern us, right? These are the words that are going to convey you the meaning of these words. Those words are different because these words are never, these words do not give you the meaning of, these words are never used as subject or a verb or an object. Main, these are just connectors, right? These just connect subject, object, and verb. So all of those connection, connecting words, they're all mabni, they're steady state, right? They, they don't change form because they don't need to change form, okay? The words that act as subject or a, a verb or an object, these are the words that change form, i.e. their case endings. They change their endings to convey the meaning of them being a subject or an object or a uh, verb or X, Y, and Z in, in, in a sentence, okay? So, so far, we've understood that the words that do not form any important element of a sentence, like the verb or the subject or the object, those words are called mabni. They are the steady state words, i.e. they do not change their case endings. They stay upon the same form. Okay? On the other hand, we have the words which are called mu'arab, i.e., they do show their case endings, right? They do show their case endings. And these are the words that form the, the building blocks of a sentence, the most important elements of a sentence, i.e. the verbs, subject, and object, or the information about uh, each of these three, right? And uh, since case endings are, are basically the, the uns, uns, and ins at the end of the words, and the case endings are shown by the vowels, um, it uh, makes sense for us to take a step back and start off with enumerating the number of vowels in Arabic, right? And as we know, it's, uh, it's no secret and not a very difficult task to do because there's only three Arabic vowels, right? There's the lumma, okay? Then there's the fatah, okay? 
Then you have the kasra. And I'll mention the fourth one, which is the absence of these three, i.e. sukun. Okay? The absence of these three vowels. Right? Now, your dhamma would be... Uh, as in the word kitabun or al kitabu or kitaban or al kitaba right kasra would be fil fi kitabin or fil kitabi. Okay? And then, of course, the sukun be something like uh, lam yazrib. The b, right, the silent b at the end, would be the case ending of this word. Now, the dhamma, it signifies your subjects right the fatha signifies an object the kasra signifies the words of relevance the words of relevance are these these are the extra bits of information about the object or the subject uh, or the verb in the uh, of the sentence, right? These these are additional information uh, blocks for the three main element uh, elements of the sentence, right? And um, the last bit, sukun. This is this is this is mostly seen. This is pretty much always seen in a verb, right? So technically. The words used for each of these uh, states in Arabic are Rafa'un Rafa'un Nasbun and Jarrun and then jazm okay jazman when someone says that this word is marfu' i.e. this word has rafa' you're basically saying that this word forms the subject of the sentence when you say that this word is mansub you say that you're basically saying that this word forms the, the object of the sentence when you some some word it has jar or it has it is a uh, is majrur you're basically saying this word is either relevant to the object or the subject or the verb of the sentence, right? Okay, so your raf identifies your subject, your nasb identifies your object, and your jar identifies your words of relevance that can either become a uh, third or fourth uh, object in their own right, or they can just serve as uh, secondary information in a sentence, okay? Now, there's... I think it will, it will make more sense if we can see the, an example just to sort of put these concepts to practice, just quickly, before making, before, without making things complicated, inshallah. So, say we have this sentence, جَاءَ زَيْدٌ الْيَوْمَ إِلَى الْمَدْرَسَةِ فِي السَّيَارَةِ فِي السَّيَارَةِ Came, Zaid. Zaid came, الْيَوْمَ, today, إِلَى الْمَدْرَسَةِ to the school, فِي السَّيَارَةِ in the car. Right? Now, the first word, جَاءَ, is a verb. Um... The second word is Zaid, right? Zaid. And we can see from the sentence that Zaid has an un at the end. The un, which is the rafa, tells us that Zaid is the subject 
of the sentence. I.e. Zayd is the person who's coming. Or he's the one who's coming, right? He becomes the subject of the sentence. And when, he, when we read the word al the Fatha tells us that this is the object of the sentence. Because it has Nasb, right? It has a Fatha, right? And then the other two pieces of information, they both have a Kasra, right? So they have Jar on them. I.e. These, these two become blocks of relevant information, second information, to either the object or the subject or the verb and we shall see that uh, which to which uh, these are relevant in just a second inshallah so you see how the case endings signify the subject the object and the words of relevance so the extra bits of information of a sentence and um, the verbs right so these, these this is this is in a nutshell what what Arabic functions on four types of case endings, four types of case endings, and we'll mention this here. That the first two types of case endings appear in nouns and verbs. Jar only appears in a noun. The verb cannot have an e case ending. Okay, cannot have a e case ending, and the jazm only appears. In the case ending of a verb. Okay? So the nouns and the verbs both can have a U sound at the end. Or an A sound at the end. Right? The uh, the, the, the nouns uh, can have an E sound at the end. And this is when, the, when a noun becomes uh, an additional information of the sentence. Okay? Only the noun can have an E sound at the end. And a sukun... The jazm is, is what only a verb can have at the end of it, right, as a case ending. N uh, the noun can't have that, right? So the rafa and nasb are both used in the verbs and the nouns that form the subject or the object. And the jar is specif specifically used with the those nouns that form relevant uh, bits of information in a sentence. And jazm uh, is specifically used with the verbs. Um, and it is to do with what we'll explain in just a second, inshallah. Before we can move on to that, let's just quickly summarize this. That we have three harakat and one absence of haraka, right? We have three vowels and we have the fourth property, which is the absence of vowel, right? So these are the four types of case endings that you can find in any type of Arabic word. The dhamma signifies a subject. It would always signifies a subject. No object can ha ever have a, a dhamma, an u or an un sound. And a would always signify uh, an object of a sentence. And e would always signify something of relevance to either uh, three of the ele uh, important elements of the sentence, either the object or the subject or the verb. Okay? And then the last bit, which is sukun, i.e. jazm, that's relevant to only the verbs, and we'll come to that in just a second, right? So just to see that happening in this sentence once more, Ja'a is a verb, Zaydun is, is the subject because it has an un, al yawma is the, the object, right, of the sentence because it has an a. Ila al-madrasati is the first piece of information, and fisayarati is the second piece of information, right? Now, if we pay attention to the translation of this uh, Sentence Zed came. When did he come? He came today, right? So that's the first object of the sentence. Now, the sentence is basically complete, but if I, if, if I was to furthermore ask, he came today, sure, where did he come? Well, the, the first piece of, uh, piece of information becomes uh, relevant. He came to the school, Ila al right? And well, okay, sure. He came to the madrasa. He came today. How did he come? Did he walk? Did he take the bus? Did he use the car? Did he ride a bike? What, what did he do? Well, he came. Fisayara. He came in the car. Right? So this is the second piece of information. And then, what you can do is, you can transform these bits of information uh, into objects in their own right. So this first piece of information could become 
the object number two, and this could become the object number uh, three in its own right if treated separately. But there was these two, these two would definitely, in, in, in either case, either you treat them as separate information or you treat them as second or third object in a sentence, they would always be relevant to one of the three. And in this case, they are relevant to the verb. Okay? Now, thus far we've identified that rafa nasb is, is happens in both uh, verbs and nouns. Because nouns and verbs are what form a sentence, right? So, uh, it happens in both nouns and verbs. Jar only happens in nouns, and nouns uh, only when they form uh, important information uh, about the, the important blocks and elements of the sentence, i.e. the object, subject, and verb. Jazm, on the other hand, is, spe is specific to the verbs. Jazm, i.e. sukun at the end, the case, as a case ending, will not come, will not appear in a noun. Now, in a sentence, in a sentence, when a verb comes, the only difference is the un, the a, and the 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 the, the, the absence of uh, any vowel, uh, any case ending, on a verb does not signify it being a because the verb cannot be a subject or an object, right? It cannot be. Uh, that element of the, of the sentence the verb is is where you start off it's, it's it's the most important piece of information about something that something is, is the subject of the topic that you're discussing i.e giving information about the subject to the verb right so but so the word the verb when the verb changes its case ending it gives you a different kind of information right when it does it does do that shift of the case ending for a very particular reason. Okay? So, let's talk about verbs now. Verbs are three types. And these three types are based on their form structure. Right? Not, ba not based on just their time frames. As not past, present, and future. But rather their form structure. Right? If you look on the left over here, you have... The, word, the, the past verb, i.e. qala, he said. The present and the future word, right? The verb that is used for either the present or the future. Yaqulu, he says, or he said, he will say. And then you have the command verb, i.e. commanding someone to do something or not do something, right? That's how the, the Arabic verbs are classified into three very specific form structures. Qal, yaqul, qul, right? Past. Command and present and future. Now, when we talk about inflection and case endings, we normally only refer to the nouns, the subject and the object, because the verb normally does not change its uh, case ending based on any, um, any, 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 anything to do with the sentence itself. Okay, the verb, the the the, the shifting of case endings in the nouns happens very differently to how it happens in the verbs. What we've discussed up till now, that's all to do with the nouns primarily. Okay. With the verbs, on the other hand, it's different. So, whereas majority of the nouns become subject and object, and they have to give that very specific information, they have to change the case ending to give that information. But the verb does not have to do that. The verb doesn't have to do that, right? Because the verb is a verb, and it's identified using other means, which we'll cover in uh, the next uh, coming uh, videos, inshallah. It's identified using other means, right? So ident identifying nouns and verbs is a, is a separate procedure. So identifying which one, which word is a subject, which one, which word is an object, and so on and so forth. So when you identify verbs, you identify them using some uh, characteristics, right? Now that you've identified a verb, why would it? Why do you think it would change its case ending? It has to change its case ending to give a very specific type of information. Mm -hmm. It can't be a subject because the verbs do not, they, they become information about a subject. And they cannot be an object mm -hmm. because objects are information about the subject itself, right? Or they are, or the verb gives you information about the subject and what that action is being done upon. So that becomes the object, right? So the verb becomes information for both of them. Right, so it can't it can't have the same case endings as the as as a subject or the object. 
So when the verb has case endings, it's for a very specific piece of reason. And so it doesn't really have need to have. It's, it's very similar to the mabni or the steady state words in this sense. Because in a sentence, it doesn't need to change its case ending to give any uh, important meaning. Right? So what you, based on what you have in front of you, verb being either the past form or the command form or the middle one which is the present slash future form when a verb is either the past or the command verb when a word is when a verb is of the past tense it's specified to the past right the meaning is is specified on this time frame and on a spectrum of time to the past right so it's specified when it's so when, when it's fixed in the past it does not change that meaning, right? So there's no, there's no, there's no room for 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 changing the time frame, right? It's in the past. It stays in the past. Whereas on the command, when you give a, give a command, it's also specified to time frame, which is in the future. I.e., you're giving command for something that is not exist, that does not exist at the moment, or it's an action that's not been done yet. Hence, hence, why you're giving command for for it to happen, right? So these two these two verbs, because they stay their meaning, right? I.e., the verb gives two pieces of information. I, uh, one, it gives you the meaning of what is happening, i.e., the, the actual action, and it gives you the the, the time frame of uh, that action happening. And because the past verb is spe- is specified to the past, and the command is specified to something happening in the future, these words do not need to change their case endings because uh, they don't need to give any uh, piece of information that needs clarification. Whereas the word that is sort of in the middle, and it could also could, it could either be used in the past or the or the or the present or the future. It needs information. It needs a way to tell you that this the I am I I as a verb am am specified to either the past or the present or the future or the far future. X, Y, and Z, which is why the future verbs, the future, uh, the, the 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 present or the future verbs, i.e., in this case, yakulu or v- verbs like these uh, of this form, right? They are the only verbs that change case endings, right? The past and the command verbs do not, do not need to, as their information is very specific, it's very clear. With these verbs, the information is not clear, so they need to change their case ending to tell you. Uh, which, where? I mean, they're telling you the act, the action, uh, the meaning of of the action that's being performed inside. They, they convey that meaning of action, but where, 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 in which time frame does that does that take place? So to specify that, the word that specifies its time frame, that word determines which kind of case ending this uh, middle kind of uh, verb would have. Okay. So I'll give you three uh, examples on the, on the screen here. So you have. لم يقول لما يقول and لن يقول so يقول is to say something now or in the future so there's there's this room for uh, specifying when this thing takes place well, when you say لم يقول it means the person has not spoken in the past whatsoever لم يقول he has not spoken up to this point whatsoever لم يقول right so it gives 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 you that information now because it has specified its meaning, for, you know, it, it's changed, it's transformed its meaning from that a kind of, uh, you know, room for confusion. Okay, so if, is it happening in the middle or is it happening now or is it happening in the future? It's removed that doubt and it's specified the meaning of this action in the past and in the negative sense. Okay, it has, in the past, it has not happened. This, this action of speaking by this person, him, this has not happened, right? So this is what this uh, sukun on this verb conveys to you when lam comes uh, at the beginning of it. Whereas the second case, where it says lam ma yaqul, right? This verb also specifies the time frame of this verb, right? It also puts it in the negative uh, sense. The only difference is when the word lam ma is used as opposed to lam, the meaning is that the the action is has not been done yet in the past, but there's a possibility that it might happen uh, now or in the near future, right? There's a, there's a possibility, okay? So it gives you that extra piece of information, right? 
that, that word does. But lam, lam just tells you it, it has, it's not happened. It's not giving you any other information, okay? But lam tells you that this might happen. Whereas, when you say the third case, lan yaqula, right? Now, lan, it specifies or fixates this verb to the future. It will, he will never speak. Lan yaqula. He will never say a thing. Lan yaqula. He will never say such a thing. I in the future, right? So, when you specify this verb, with the future, you change its case ending from يَقُولُ to لَنْ يَقُولَ Right, so that la with the addition of la at the beginning, tells you that this verb, this action has now been specified on this time frame to the far left spe spectrum, which is uh, the future. Okay, inshallah. So this is, in a nutshell, the concept of irab, i.e. inflection, uh, towards the end of the Arabic words. And this is, these are the the most important characteristics of the of the uh, Arabic language in terms of its inflection towards the end uh, of its ending uh, of its words, and hopefully, inshallah, uh, these these things will be put into practice as we move along uh, this discourse, and we do more uh, reading and we do more uh, practice uh, exercises and we do more um, of the content digging into uh, the case scenarios of the, each of these uh, uh, technical terms, inshallah, especially in the, the fourth video where we'll be covering all the important uh, sentence structures, um, i.e. The, the, with, the, with the usage of uh, each of the most recurrent verbs, nouns, and uh, conjunction words. Um, when we see that happening, uh, it will be so much more clearer how the, the Arabs use these different case settings in uh, practical cases, right, inshallah. So everything will come together, bi'idhan ta'ala. So until then, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.